Our top stories tonight all seem to be old news. The blight of racism remains in the news this week. What seems to be a constant underlining issue has once again erupted and exploded through the surface like an active volcano. Bullying, not just an elementary playground issue. In days gone by, one bully's bluster could easily be overlooked. But in today's society, we're seeing how one mindless social media comment can go viral and remain on a person's record for a lifetime. Meanwhile, drug abuse continues to plague our communities, with hundreds of thousands of lives being impacted by the problem of addiction. What's to be done about an issue that is devastating rich and poor across our land? Certainly, the war on drugs requires more than a slogan. These reoccurring stories and more are our topics in this week's message series as we recognize our need for a reality check. Live on tape from our beautiful studios in Darden Prairie, Missouri, welcome to Morning Star Church and Reality Check featuring Robin Hunt and the Reality Check Band with special music by Elizabeth Carter. Today's special guest from the Awaken Project, Joe Richardson. Op opioid senior consultant and MSC hospitality leader, Kim Earl. Featuring a personal testimony from our own Dave. And now, here he is, your pastor in mind, Mike Schreiner! How you doing, brother? I'm all right. How are you? Oh, uh, this is it. This Looking is it. Looking spiffy We're today. Wrapping it up. Uh, hey, give it. He's introduced everybody else. Let's give it up for our wingman. Come on now. My co-host, Pastor Keith. Looking all dapper again today, yeah, baby. I hope this is the last of this series because I'm at the end of my wardrobe, man. <laughs> all the suits. <laughs> all the suits. That? Yeah. 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 That's good. You're looking sharp today. Well, thank looking you, sharp. you too. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, we're at last segment of Reality Check. If you're, uh, if you're new, if you're joining us uh, here at the campus or, or online or Facebook Live, we have been taking a look at issues that we believe we need a reality check on. Things that are really going on right here underneath our noses and we tend to overlook. We tend to think this is something on the East Coast, the West Coast, the big city, not happening right here under our own noses and yet we are uh, we're being we're given some incredible information by uh, our, our special guest and uh, and I thank you for being here last uh, few weeks we've took a, taken a look at bullying uh, we've taken a look at racism we've taken a look at drugs uh, these are things that affect every segment of our society but particularly our young people uh, which is why we're doing it right now uh, as our young people are getting ready to go back to school most of them have already started back to school now, when we were young, um, you know, you turned on the movies or TV right. and, and the drug stuff, you right. know, we made fun of stoners, yeah. right? Like yeah. Cheech and Chong. Cheech and Chong were you a right. Cheech and yeah. Chong guy? Oh, man, come on. Hey, let me in, man. It's Dave. <laughs> that's, Dave's that's, not here, man. <laughs> that was good. That's that was good. good. Got some 70s folks yeah, here. That's good. I'm, I'm more of a uh, 80s kind yeah. of Jeff Spigoli guy. Oh, Remember yeah. him? Uh, Jeff Fast Spigoli. Times. Fast Times right. at Ridgemont High. Dude, my dad's like a TV repairman. He's got like the ultimate set of tools. Right, and That's dead on, man. Best times at Ridgemont High with an emphasis on high. High, yeah, yeah, yeah. very much so. Um, hey, we need, to, uh, we need to take a look, though, because today, uh, in today's world, not a lot of people are making fun of drugs and drug abuse. Uh, in fact, in, in 2017, just a couple years ago, our government declared a public health emergency. Uh, this is something that's affecting every segment of our society from the big bustling cities down to the smallest, tiniest rural communities. This is not a rich or poor issue. Drugs are affecting every segment, black, white. It is affecting our teenagers. It's also affecting our parents. It's also affecting our grandparents. It's affecting our unborn children. This is something that we have to get a handle on. little education about just what is uh, an, an opioid. Uh, there are legal and illegal versions of this drug. The illegal ones are the ones we've heard of, opium, we've heard of heroin, uh, but there are so many prescription drugs out there, and this is a, the slippery slope 
uh, as we're going to find out today, uh, not just the illegal stuff that's going on, you know, stuff being sold in a parking lot out of a van, but, but in our own medicine cabinets, oxycotton, oxycodone, fentanyl, and morphine. The, the statistics are actually pretty staggering. 64,000 drug overdose deaths. Mm -hmm. These are from 2016. It's kind of the latest stats that are, are a comprehensive um, program from the uh, CDC. Uh, out of those 64,000 drug overdose deaths, 66% of them are opioid related. This is, the, this is the big problem, the opioids. 130 people die every day from opioid overdose. And 80% of heroin users, this is the illegal, actually started by getting their hands on a prescription. Might have been something that they were prescribed. It might have been prescribed to a parent or an uncle or raided the medicine cabinet. Let's take a look at these, uh, just the prescriptions. 214 million prescriptions written in 2016. 214 million prescriptions for opioids. That quadrupled in less than a decade. We have over 11 million people abusing those prescriptions, 1,000 people every day being treated in our ER, and 40% of overdose deaths are as a result of prescriptions being abused. And this is taking a toll on every segment of our society, including our wallet. Take a look at this. In the United States, the economic burden is $78.5 billion, with a B. Uh, dollars every single year so this is affecting us it's affecting us personally there are people that we know I've been amazed this weekend at the number of people who said hey there is somebody in my family who's struggling with this we know this this is personal it's economic it's affecting every segment of our society and yet we often don't find out about it until it's too late we want to hide this we want to keep it in the darkness then it comes out it's in the light but oftentimes people unfortunately, uh, have already passed away. Demi Lovato, uh, she wrote a song several years ago called Sober, and in this song she was telling her parents, her fans, her, her friends, that after six years of sobriety, she had relapsed. Uh, so tonight, we're going to have our very own reality check band pr uh, provide their rendition of Demi Lovato's song, Sober. Let's give it up for the band. Yeah, man. Excuses for all of these goodbyes. Call me when it's over, as I'm dying inside. Wake me when the shakes are gone and the cold sweats disappear. Call me when it's over and myself has reappeared. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know why I do it every, every, every time it's over. I just want to cave in, I don't want to fight I try and I try and I try and I try and I try Just hold me, I'm alone Mama, I'm so sorry, I'm not sober anymore Daddy, please forgive me for the drinks spilled on the floor To the ones who never left me We've been down this road before
She was an alcoholic by the age of 16. Um, she got to work through the program in the landing, our teen program, and she also works for a local treatment center, helping other kids through their addictions and their compulsive behaviors. So to see the transformation that God has done in her life, how, how she not only got the help through the landing, but now she's able to help and mentor other teens. I know that some of the girls see me as a leader and like, they're supposed to learn something from me, but I think I learn more from them than they learn from me. But when I see them get something, they'll, you know, open my eyes to something that I didn't see. With the landing, we're, we're all teenagers, so we are really hard on ourselves. So we all, like, kind of motiva motivate each other upwards and help each other, and it's, it's really nice. We all have a connection here, like, we're all here for a reason. We all are there for each other, and we let each other know that. You know, struggling, we're all broken, but we're all in it together, and we're all supporting each other, not against each other, or trying to label each other, or whatever, and I've seen the changes. I just want the same thing for them. I am more, like, hopeful for myself and for my family. If you looked at me from when everything first happened to now, it's a totally different look, and I like care for myself and care for others way better than I did, which sounds sad, but it's really good. <laughs> it's important because we need to, to stop the cycle of dysfunction in families. I know even in my family, I caused a lot of chaos. You know, through many, many years, my, my kids see nothing but, but chaos. And for these kids to finally get stability and have a place with structure for the first time in their lives, they thrive in it. They're able to to see love, real love, what love really looks like, the love of Jesus for the first time. I never really believed in myself or that I could succeed in certain things. And as soon as I like opened up myself to God, he like took over and really helped me, which was something I never imagined in my life. So it's been really interesting to like find out through everything that I've been through that he's always there to help me. Great message. Beautiful. Huh? Beautiful. Come Love the now. fact that, and so many people don't, I mean, there's still so much that folks don't realize about Celebrate Recovery. They think it's just drugs and alcohol, but it's all hurts, all habits, all yep. hang-ups, and the fact that we've got the landing for our, our young people right. who are struggling, and also, you know, the ministry for just the kids that are caught up in what Shane said, the chaos. They're not the ones being, you know, abusing the drugs and alcohol, right. but uh, they're certainly uh, being swept up in it. You know, our kids were uh, the first CR in the country to have teenagers go all the way through the 12 steps. Right here. Right here. Oh, right here. Yes. Right here. Oh, good stuff. Hey. You're beautiful. Get ready right now uh, to welcome our guest. We have Joe Richardson and Kim Earl here to the Reality Check Stage. Thank you. Oh, guys, hey, again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for your time this week. And what we've experienced is over the last few weeks that the folks who sit in that couch, uh, as you've done the last couple services, have brought just incredible information that has impacted uh, and informed. And, and, and I know today that there's going to be at least one life that is going to be saved because of what you guys are, are here to share. So thank you. Kim, I'm going to start with you. You emailed me this week, and I was just kind of blown away by your title. Uh, tell us what you do there at Mercy. So I am a pharmacist with Mercy, but I have kind of a unique role. Um, my title is Senior Consultant for Opioid Stewardship. So what that means is that I lead Mercy Health System in their efforts to combat the opioid epidemic. And in a hospital system, we do that by making sure we put policies, procedures, protocols, and processes into place to make sure we are appropriately prescribing opioids and providing resources for patients with opioid use disorder. So when we uh, flash the, the statistics nationwide, the very fact that St. Louis here at Mercy has an opioid stewardship department uh, signals that we're not immune, right? In fact, the statistics in St. Louis, tell us about those. Yes, yeah, so he shared with you some of the statistics nationwide, and um, the 
metropolitan area here, St. Louis is actually a little more grim. We lose one individual life every 14 hours from opioid related deaths. Mm. And where the nation has seen a slight improvement in the last year, we have actually had a 27% increase in our opioid related deaths. Wow, wow. Um, statistic, uh, one person dies every 14? 14 hours in the St. Louis metropolitan area. One life, man, that's, a, that's somebody's daughter, somebody's son, somebody's dad, somebody's grandma. Uh, every 14 hours. That's crazy. Um, what, who are the folks who are at risk here? Because we tend to stereotype when we think about, you know, drugs in general, opioids in particular, the Cheech and Chong, the Jeff Spigoli. It ain't, it ain't that way these days. Um, this can affect anyone. So any individual that has a medication, an opioid type medication, is at risk for opioid overdose. Um, those medications are prescribed in higher strengths. Um, higher dosages, and when in combined with other medications like benzodiazepines, uh, common names are Xanax and Valium, or um, muscle relaxers, or sleep aids, and alcohol, those things all increase your risk. Wow. So um, you've got a captive audience, and we are listening. What would you tell? What do you want parents, grandparents, uh, friends and family, what do you want them to know? I think there's a few things we all can know to prepare ourselves and uh, keep our family members and our loved ones safe. If you have opioids in your home, you need to safely store them, and the recommendation is to keep them locked up so that others can't access them. Um, statistics have shown that only 20% of individuals that were the intended recipients of those medications are abusing them, whereas the other 80% are getting their hands on your opioid medications and using them without being the intended recipients. Um, after safely storing them during use, you finished your course, you have some leftover medication, you need to make sure you properly dispose of those medications. And there's a couple ways you can do that. If you're able to take it to your local police station here in Wentzville area, O'Fallon, St. Charles County, we have disposal sites and you can drop off the medication. It looks like a old fashioned mailbox. You can drop them off there twice a year in October and in April. We have DEA sponsored take back days. You can take your medications there for disposal. There is a list on the FDA website where you can identify medications that are safe for toilet flushing and that keeps it you know, out of others' hands. Um, alternatively, everyone has Ziploc bags at home. You can put your medications in the Ziploc bag. You don't need to crush them and then cover them with kitty litter or coffee grounds or dirt, something that makes them not as desirable, and then just throw them in your trash. Mm -hmm. And then um, lastly, if you have someone that's at risk for opioid uh, overdose or someone who's taking opioids chronically, it's really important to keep a life-saving medication on hand. Um, you've probably heard of Narcan, naloxone is the other name. Um, Narcan specifically is available in a nasal spray and it's very easy to administer, and it can save your loved one's life if they're experiencing an opioid overdose. Um, it's the same medication we use in the hospital whenever there's an overdose patient brought into our emergency room. You can access it from any pharmacy. You do not have to have a prescription from your physician. All you have to do is ask the pharmacist, and there's a protocol in the state so that they can give it to you either on your prescription insurance or sold to you at retail cost if you prefer. Kim, thanks for that information. You've also provided us with some websites. Uh, if you've got our app, right after the sermon notes, uh, we've provided those websites on the Morningstar app. We'll also be putting them our, on our website uh, so that if you want anything from the CDC or whatever, uh, more statistics, more help um, for yourself or a family member, we will uh, have that. Thanks for providing those for us. And Joe, um, your story is a little less kind of clinical. Uh, it's a lot more personal. Share, uh, share how the whole drug thing Thank you for having family. us today. Appreciate it. Yeah. And, uh, 2012, the 12th, uh, at 1.38 Sunday afternoon, I received a call from the police department that my son had OD'd on heroin. It's been seven years. It seems like yesterday. Yeah. And uh, it, ne it doesn't get any easier. Yeah, and that was, um, you know, we... Again, we 
tend to think of stereotypes. BJ um, grew up popular kid, athletic kid, musical kid, just had a lot of stuff going for him, but uh, just took one, one little wrong step and the trajectory of his life changed. Tell us about that. Well, it's, I always like to tell people, and, and this goes for everybody's child, that we raised them in church, we did the right things, took them places, spent time with them. But, you know, he wasn't a bad kid, he made a bad choice. Yeah. And the bad choice he made ended up being fatal because this can happen to you anywhere at any time, it doesn't discriminate, and one time does matter. Yeah. Once could change your life. Well, one time, put that taste in his mouth, if you will, right? And to get, I mean, you just don't lose that. It's not like you try heroin, you try one of these opioids, and your body literally craves that. Very strong craving because the, the opiates that's coming into our country today and the heroin is 80 to 90% pure. Back in the 60s, it used to be 10 to 12%. And back then, it was a rich man's drug. Yeah. That they, can, they can get it so cheap today, and it's, it's everywhere. Yeah, the, the power, you know, the strength is, is increasing, the cost is decreasing, so our kids are jumping straight to what's Correct. affordable, and it can be one time, because so many of these kids might look at friends or, or, or whatever, and they're doing it, and nothing's happened to them yet, and they do it one time, and it's over and done. Yes, I, I lost four kids off my Little League baseball team to, to heroin overdoses, and one was my son. Four kids one baseball team that you coached when your kid was growing up and uh, that's that's and, staggering and you know i preached them because i played professional baseball about what to look for to stay away from because yeah. we were always given a speech every year yeah. by an fbi agent that would yeah. come in and tell you these are the red flags these are the signs you yeah. don't talk to these people i did the same with my kids you did everything right we can do everything right but we have to know some of the signs what are the red flags talk about some of the red flags so parents and, and grandparents might I noticed pick my, up on my stuff. son's demeanor changed he started going through a lot more money than usual uh, sleeping in the middle of the day a little more hostile at times over regular conversation than the normal way he would be uh, my uh, my wife asked me one time she goes well, well, you take your lunch to work what do you do give the spoons away to people at work I'm like what are you talking about she goes well all of our spoons are gone Mm. My son was using the spoons to get his stuff ready to go. Wow. Wow. What, um, you've learned a lot. I mean, this is kind of, uh, you've taken this, obviously, not only personally, but then you've tried to pay it forward, you know, this pain in your life. Out of that, you've birthed something called the Awaken Project that we're going to host here on Thursday night. Tell us a little bit about that. The Awaken Project started because of my son, and I, and I always like to tell kids, this is not about my son, and now it's about you. Because we go into schools and we educate kids on the evils of heroin and what drugs can do to you, the opiate crisis, and try to empower them to make better choices. Right. And we've been in over five states and 150 schools in six years. Wow, that's good stuff. I've, I've seen it, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, thanks for not letting it end. But to take that, it's, I think that's what our God does, man. He takes us in, a, in, our, in our sin. He takes us when we're at our bottom and is able to redeem that. And I can't imagine what that does for you every time you have to get up and tell that story and relive it. But you're changing lives, brother. Way it's, to go. It's therapy for me, and it's, it's very helpful, but it's, it's tough. What do, you, what do you want these people to know? It's your, your turn now. Speak to these folks. What can they know that's going to help them stop this don't wait till it's personal everybody likes to be reactive not proactive be proactive educate yourself look into heroin addict opiate abuse you'll see all the things there you need to know to educate yourself uh, a couple of statistics for you parents who talk to their kids on a regular basis are 67 percent less likely to become an alcoholic drug addict abuser and another statistic I, I just got this week one out of three sixth graders in 10 years will lose a parent to heroin or opiates. That is staggering. That is staggering. I want to thank both of you guys for what you do to help our whole communities get better, to have an awareness, 
and to get help. Uh, both Kim and Joe are going to be in the lobby after the service. If you want to come up and, and talk to them, ask them, uh, they are a wealth of information. Uh, as I said, Kim's websites that she's provided are, are on the app on the website. Uh, Joe and the Awaken Project, uh, that information is actually printed in your bulletin. So you can go to the website, and if you want to make any kind of donations to help them continue this uh, incredible awareness ministry, uh, we'd invite you to do that. Guys, thank you so much for being here. Excellent work. Join us Thursday night as our Celebrate Recovery team is presenting a special service featuring Jeff Mazingo and Joe Richardson in a high-energy, multi-sensory experience designed to awaken this generation about the impact of our choices. As usual, Celebrate Recovery starts at 6 p.m. with dinner and is followed at 7 p.m. right here in this room with a service fully taken over this week by the Awaken Project. So if you've been looking for an excuse to come to Celebrate Recovery, invite your family and friends. Join us this Thursday night starting at 6 p.m. We'll see you there. Awesome. Love the fact that we are offering these next steps every single week. And uh, if you've got anybody in middle school up to high school, I would highly encourage you to bring that child this week. Whether you suspect something or not, be proactive, not reactive. And, uh, and I know you'll be blessed by the presentation this Thursday night. Hey, as you know, uh, what we've been doing over the last few weeks at Reality Check is we, we talk about the reality with the statistics nationwide right here in our own community. Then we invite some folks up who have some skin in the game, some personal experience, and the awareness that they create has been huge. But, but ultimately, as people of faith, we find our, our source of wisdom and guidance from the scriptures. And, uh, and while... We open the Bible and we, we don't see the word drugs in the Bible. You know, Jesus, uh, even, even Judas, didn't have an opioid problem. Uh, I think there are specific things in the Bible that actually go to the heart of addiction and create awareness and opportunity for us. And I'd like to point out a couple of those uh, and then get to one scripture today. And uh, that scripture is going to be applicable to every person here in the room. Even if you're uh, not a Christian, if you're just here today because someone invited you, maybe you're, you're here just kind of checking out the whole Christianity thing, uh, I really want you to hear this scripture today, and uh, because I think it's got some, some impact, some takeaway, it's going to meet you where you are. Uh, so let's jump in. All sins separate us from God. Not all sins create the same consequences. All sins, sin, this is what sin does. Sin is anything that is opposite to God and His will for our life. And when we sin, the Bible says that creates distance. It creates separation. God doesn't go anywhere. We're the ones who go somewhere. Adam and Eve sinned. God didn't go anywhere. God continued to come. Adam and Eve hide in the bushes. That's what it, uh, sin does. It creates separation from God. But listen, not all sin carries the same consequences. I get this a lot. You know, Pastor, I know, I know, all sin is the same in God's eyes. It's all sin. Yeah, but no. All sin creates a separation between us and God, but, but all sin is not equal. All sin carries very different consequences in our lives, right? I mean, let's just think. Gossip is a sin, but gossip is a whole lot different in terms of the consequences than going out and taking someone's life, murdering someone, right? Hey, envying, taking a look at what my neighbor has and envying what my neighbor has, that's a sin. Sleeping with my neighbor's wife has a totally different consequence. So while all sin separates us from God, all sin is not equal because it carries very different consequences. And sometimes there are choices that carry catastrophic consequences. We see this in the Bible. We see, you know, the crowds, you know, making fun of Noah when he's building the ark. That was a catastrophic consequence when the flood came. We see today certain choices that we make that are literally one and done. You get behind the wheel of a car and you decide to text or you get behind the wheel of a car and you're intoxicated, that can be game over for you or for someone else. We, uh, we've had too many people in our own church who've lost loved ones because of people who've texted or, or drank before they drive. Sex outside of marriage can lead to some catastrophic consequences. Used to be if you had sex outside of marriage and you got an STD, you take a pill and things kind of clean, 
cleared up there in the, in the next couple weeks. These days, you can catch an STD that you carry with you for life. There are STDs that can literally end your life. There are pregnancies that you did not plan for or prepare for. Certain choices that we make have very different consequences than any other sin. Certain choices are one and done, catastrophic, and that's what Kim and Joe were here to tell us today. That it just takes one time. It can be different for every single person. In fact, so many people who overdose have made the decision to um, do drugs, to do alcohol. They've built up a certain tolerance. Their, their body gets used to it. It takes a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more to kind of get that same feeling, that same kind of high. They get clean, and then they're tempted. They relapse, like Demi Lovato. They relapse, and they start out where they left off, and their body can't take it, and it's literally done. Young people, there are consequences to our actions. God will forgive us, but that doesn't mean that we're you know, immune, exempt from the consequences. And some of those choices are so significant that it can literally change the trajectory of your life forever or end your life. This is why choices are so important because making the right choices, making the right choices in life does this with your life. It creates opportunity. More right choices, the more opportunity. You start making right choices in middle school, in high school, in college. All of a sudden, your opportunities that are going to unfold before you get wider and wider. But young people, listen, that funnel works the other way. Bad choices begin to limit the options that you have. It, it's not that God doesn't love you. It's just it's not that God's not going to forgive you. It's just certain choices that we make in life instead of having all kinds of can do this, this, this. Now we're just limited. It's, it's, it's just this. And so make a decision right now to begin making those right choices. I want to give you one more thing here before we get to our scripture. Most catastrophic choices, these kind of one and done game over choices, are the result of incremental actions. Most of us don't wake up someday and go, you know what? Today I'm going to go out and do the most stupid thing in the whole world. I'm going to, you know, get behind the wheel of a car. I'm going to drink. I'm going to drive. I'm going to text. I'm going to start using drugs. Most of us have a line that we look for, and that line is sin. And that line tells us, here's how far I have to go before I'm actually doing the wrong thing. And most of us want to live right up as close to that line as possible. And we dance with that temptation and we entertain that temptation and every day we make decisions most people who get behind the wheel of a car and have an accident because they're driving drunk have done it 14 20 40 times before but it's a series of decisions that we make along the way we had a former bishop who had a sermon he called it nibbling our way lost I didn't really like the title of the sermon but I think that he's talking about sheep that sheep just don't turn and run real fast and all of a sudden they're lost a uh, sheep will kind of see something and it'll, and it'll nibble and then he'll see something and it'll nibble and he'll see something and, and then he wake up one day and he's a long way away from the shepherd that's kind of how we often live it's not we wake up one day, but it's a series of small choices every single day that's going to lead us to a place where God is going to bless us or it's going to lead us to a place of being lost. I love what Gary Blair says. He says, every choice carries a consequence. For better or worse, each choice is the unavoidable consequence of its predecessor. One choice leads to another, to another. A good choice leads to a better choice, leads to a best choice. A bad choice leads to a worse choice, leads to a worse. They're always connected to one another. Here's our scripture today. Written by Solomon, arguably one of the wisest men who ever lived. This is in the Old Testament book of Proverbs, chapter 22, verse 3. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. Say this with me. The prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and pay the penalty. The prudent are wise people. Wise people see where this is leading. Wise people can look ahead and see, man, there is danger. I'm going to take refuge. I'm going to start making decisions right now so that I don't have this collision course with death and destruction. The simple people think, well, that's not going to happen to me. I'm the exception to that rule. That will never happen because wise people, prudent people see danger. They take refuge. 
Everybody wants to be wise. The naive people, the simple people, they just think they're the exception to the rule until it's too late. So here's a challenge today. Make the wise decision. Make the wise decision. Here's how you make the wise decision. You pause and consider consequences before making my choice. We play it out. Most people dance with temptation, and, and, the, and the temptation that they're dealing with is the instant gratification, right? Man, I wonder what it would be like to go out with her. I wonder what it would be like to taste that. I wonder what it would be like to sit at that poker table. I wonder what it would be like to push that button on my computer. We dance with temptation thinking that, you know, it's going to bring immediate pleasure, and it will. If you're not having fun sinning, you're doing it wrong. Let's just be real. Sin provides instant pleasure, but long-term pain. Catastrophic consequences. So, young people, the, the, the time to make a plan for your life, the time to draw that line and then back off and create a guardrail rail is right now. It's a safe place. It's not when you're in the midst of that temptation. You get to decide who you are. You get to decide your character. You get to decide your destiny. You get to decide your future. And you decide that ahead of time. So you're not putting yourself in that place where friends are tempting you. You're saying, this is who I'm going to be. It's what I'm going to allow myself to say yes to. It's going to be what I allow myself to say no to. To get out of that situation and to think it through. Not to the point of saying, oh, it's going to be so fun, which it will. But continue to think it through. Continue to play out the story beyond going out with her, beyond taking that drink to the point where your darkness has been brought out into the light, when your parents find out, when your spouse discovers the truth, when your coworkers, your boss, it all comes out. It's your faith, it's your family, it's your future, it's your, it's your character. It's being able to look at yourself in the mirror. So how do you make the wise decision? You pause to consider the consequences before making that choice, and you ask yourself, am I choosing God's blessing, or am, am I settling for instant gratification? You go to school. You, you, you put in the work because the, doing the right things creates opportunity. It's not fun in the moment, but the more you make the wise decision, you're going to put yourself in a place where God will bless you. We've got to think this through. We've got to be willing to simply make wise decisions, to know where the line is, to create a guardrail and say, this is where I'm going to live my life. And as I live my life in these places, I'm putting myself in a place where God can bless me. And I want to end with this. The good news is, even as we're experiencing the consequences, maybe even of some catastrophic choices, our God is a God who continues to reach out and extend his grace and his mercy, his love, and his forgiveness. The good news is that we can't out the grace of God. Those sins carry consequences that we have to deal with, but no matter what we've done and no matter how many times we've done it, our God is a forgiving God. We might run to a very far off land, but the moment that we decide to come home, Ours is a God who is there ready to receive us. Friends, moms and dads, parents and grandparents, church of Jesus Christ, we are called to be a very different kind of people, a, a, a people who knows that we have a God whose love and, and grace endures forever, but we are called to wrap our arms around this next generation. We are called to model a life that is faithful, that we create a place here for our children to come and know that God is good, he has a plan and purpose for their life, and we're going to raise them to know that kind of character and be able to stand strong so that the next generation is in a better shape than this current one and the ones that we lived in. Amen? Amen? God, we thank you for your love, and we thank you for your grace. We thank you that your mercy endures forever. God, as the rains fall outside, may the rain of your love fall upon us here. May those of us who've sinned catastrophically, 
experience your forgiveness. That while all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, by grace, by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we can be forgiven and the trajectory of our life open up brand new opportunities for us. God, if there's a person here in this room who's not put their trust in you, if I'm talking to you, if today God has spoken to you and you want to turn your life over to his lordship because willpower has not proven an effective strategy in your life, today put your trust and hope in Jesus. Say, Father, forgive me of my sin. I accept the love and the grace of Jesus Christ who with his perfect life paid the price for my sins and won my forgiveness. God, clothe me now with the Holy Spirit so that I don't go and fight temptation in my own strength, but clothe me with your Holy Spirit, that I might be able to stand strong against sin and say yes to your best for my life. And all God's people agreed and said together, Amen. Amen.